ongi etorri gutunzuria Bilbao letren nazio arteko jaialdira. Jarraian, munduarekin izketan, zure maila berekoekin bezala, izeneko solasaldia izango da, Elvira Diangani Ose eta Tania Safura Adamen artean. Elvira Diangani Ose, Bartzelonako arte garaikideko museoko zuzendaria da. Eta Tania Safura Adam, Mozambikeko kazetaria, kultura kritikaria eta Radio Afrika magazinaren sortzailea da. June Fernandez, kazetari eta Pikara magazin aldizkariaren sortzailearen laguntza izango dute. Solasaldi honetan desberdintasunaren kritika landuko dute, eta horretarako, haien jatorria inolako erreparorik gabe eta oraina sublimaziorik gabe onartzen duten proiektuak izango dituzte abiaburu. Denbora errealeko itzulpenak, mundu zaldatzeak beti mundua aldatzea dakarrela sinetsita. Bienvenidas y bienvenidos a Gutun Zuria. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Gutun Zuria Bilbao. We will now start the conversation called... Talking to the World as Equals, between Elvira Dianganasi, director of the Museum of Contemporary Art of Barcelona, and Tania Safura Adam, founder of Radio Africa, together with the journalist June Fernandez. In this conversation, they will address inequality. They'll be talking about a series of projects. They'll be talking about translations, translating live. They are convinced that um, translating is a way of changing the world. Bueno, Arratzaldeon guzti hoi, Arratzaldeon Tania eta Elvira. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Tania, Elvira. And uh, today we're going to dive into a different field of creation. We're not going to be talking about literature. We're going to be talking about art. We're going to be talking about popular music and other expressions of art. Before I introduce our speakers, our guests today, I would like to share with all of you a thought. Ines Osinaga heard this, which I'm going to describe from another colleague. And uh, the message that I'd like to convey is that, of course, we need to give a visibility to women. And uh, it's a high time for us to leave behind a patriarchal white society and we need to empower each other as women. I find this idea extremely attractive. We need to give visibility to women, but um, this paradigm of visibility can be a trap. When Elvira was appointed director of the museum, the headline of the newspaper was Elvira, the first female director of the Museum of Contemporary Art. And we sometimes forget about, uh, you know, in this case, Elvira's background. In the uh, introduction, uh, their resumes were shortly described. I'm going to share with you some more info, and I'm going to ask both of them, Tania and Elvira, to describe each other instead of themselves. We're going to kick it off in this way. I'm making my life very easy. They're going to introduce each other. It won't be myself. They're good old friends. We can draw parallelisms in their um, lives, and I believe that they can introduce each other very well because they know each other very well. Elvira Tiangani Ose, as I have mentioned, is the newly appointed director of the Museum of Contemporary Art of Barcelona. And in the interviews done to her after her appointment, she has uh, somehow turned around uh, some recurrent questions. Elvira, uh, often says that she's scared of being a woman and being black. It's others that are scared. Elvira has directed a showroom in London. She has also been a member of the Council of Thought of the Prada Foundation. She has been a curator of the uh, Gothenburg Biennale. She has also been a curator at the Tate Modern Museum. And she has a very broad resume. Uh, Elvira was born in Córdoba. 
Uh, her parents are from Equatorial Guinea and she had to travel quite a bit uh, and move uh, quite often because of her dad's uh, job. His, her dad is an architect and uh, she studied in Barcelona and then she continued her studies uh, abroad. And the first uh, question we're going to be discussing how we build our identity. And uh, But before we deep dive into that first question, I'm going uh, to um, ask uh, Tania to please describe Elvira since she knows her really well. We don't know each other that well. No, no, not at all. Well, we have been able to meet once again and had been quite some time since we had last seen each other. And in Barcelona, when I moved to Barcelona, Elvira left the city. And uh, the truth be told, I have followed her work and she had left a legacy. Elvira is omnipresent in my career as well, but she wasn't present. Yeah, something quite strange. And the first time we saw each other it was in London, if I'm not mistaken. There was a small exhibition, a very interesting exhibition. Women on Airplane was the name of that exhibition. And for me, Helvira has always been someone who was willing to give you a helping hand, a role model, uh, someone you always want to follow. And as I, uh, well, introduced myself to in the world of contemporary art, I understood that Elvira had paved the way, but there's still a long winding road ahead, uh, much work to be done. And um, Elvira has done a great deal of things. As I was saying, she paved the way, she's a trailblazer. And uh, her work uh, has always been of interest to me. And when I arrived in Barcelona, her legacy was very special because in Barcelona, I have witnessed a transformation. The work that I started to do was very much respected. And I was respected also by my peers, by my colleagues. Initially, people were somehow surprised by this leadership uh, a role, a role um, well previously played by Elvira, someone with great authority. And it's quite unfair, you know, that you have to, you know, fight for your uh, credibility. And Elvira, for me, is very important because uh, she has paved the way, I insist, and she's a personal and professional inspiration for me. Thank you. That's very kind. Tanya Safuda Adam has, well, gone through many, you know, has traveled quite a lot. She has, was born in Maputo. Her dad was a pilot. She has lived in Lisbon, in Madrid, and since 2004, she lives in Barcelona. She's a cultural critic. She has um, uh, training in international cooperation. As uh, I've read in Wikipedia, in 2012, she founded Radio Africa as a radio station, and she then uh, created the Radio Africa magazine. She has curated a series of uh, exhibitions on the uh, Black Africa and the African diaspora. She has collaborated with many media outlets like Sitio Salto. And, um, and, um, and her articles and her papers and her work, she has uh, allowed us to have a very profound understanding of uh, anti-racist uh, initiatives against colonial statutes, uh, for example. And having said this, I'd like to ask Elvira to please uh, uh, give us your opinion on Tania. Tania is a role model for me and has been. There's something very important that um, 
uh, I told her when we met at the showroom, and uh, I was very much impressed by Tanya. And uh, I understood back then that something was happening in Barcelona and across Spain. And uh, Tanya uh, was one of the individuals that was making this change happen uh, together with people with an African consciousness. Tanya was willing to go a step ahead. She was, uh, you know, working uh, on the field of identity, women, gender. She was trying to narrate the daily lives of a group of individuals. And for me, her work, you know, was very inspiring. I felt a bit jealous mm, for the fact that Tanya was working together with Amanda. And I was seeing firsthand that in Spain, a movement was, you know, being created. When I was in Spain, that movement didn't exist, and I pursued different horizons to continue my training in contemporary art, not just African contemporary art, but African culture. And I was also studying the diaspora. But then I met Sonia, I understood that there was this movement that was, you know, um, building and and uh, I remember that uh, the Time Out magazine had identified Tanya as one of the individuals that had changed the paradigm of what it is to live in the city of Barcelona. She contributed to their change, and then summer she was working at the Grec in a very important collaboration. And she was also, you know, um, rocking the foundations and she was, you know, challenging many uh, stereotypes. And um, she was, you know, engaging in an exercise to dismantle prejudice and preconceived uh, ideas. Yes, we also need to rem always need to remain vigilant regarding those preconceived uh, ideas. And, you know, I've got a certain age already, and um, I often reflect on, you know, the issue on translation, and I always think, till when is it that we need to continue translating ourselves? There are different languages, and we, as women, are, in a way, a language. And to what extent do we con have to continue translating who we are in order to be understood by others? Seems that our reality is not enough. I think that what we are doing, this exercise we're doing, is very important for future generations so that future generations don't have to translate themselves as much as we have had to translate ourselves. I arrived at Spain, you know, for a completely different world or universe. I came from Africa, from, um, well, mm, uh, Mozambique and Equatorial Guinea are very, very dissimilar, as dissimilar as Russia and Spain. But we often often think to uh, uh, tend to think that Africa is one whole, and that all African countries are similar. For me, coming here was like coming to a different world, to a different universe. And I understood that the way I view well life and uh, the way I view the world was very different. And I, um, it was uh, my life has been a constant translation exercise. I have I've had to uh, well view the the world from a different perspective. I completely agree with what you say. And um, you came from the Portuguese-speaking world to the Spanish-speaking world. And that's the world I belong to. Uh, and my, the memory of my parents as well, as my parents come from Equatorial Guinea. And, uh, of course, there are stereotypes. And stereotypes themselves are not the problem, are not the challenge. The problem is that stereotypes govern the way we engage in relationships with others, the way we interact with others. And language is very important at the end of the day because you're born in a reality with a specific language. And uh, then you come to a different universe with a different language, a different culture. You come from a universe with a specific reality where you belong. 
and then you leave the universe and uh, you feel a bit uh, lost um, and you have trouble understanding who you are. It's true that where you come from imposes a way of being, an identity. And this uh, is, well, has to do with the idea of identity at the end of the day. And one needs to find uh, his or her identity. We need to understand that, um, of course, there are intersectionalities. We can also talk about gender and religion. But here we're talking about something that is much more basic, if I may, which is what your passport says, the identity as per your passport. And I believe that the transformation of the world that we are contributing is uh, based on the idea that we always translate ourselves. And now I'm reading uh, Louis Sans and his poetry, and he talks about uh, the world, and uh, he talks about multiple identities. And Europe tends to appeal to uh, single roots. But here in Spain and the Basque Country and Catalonia, I believe that there are multiple identities, multiple roots. I have my African side. And this allows me to address this identity conflicts from a different standpoint, from a different perspective. The poetry of that author is very plural, is also multilingual. And that perhaps is the magic of that poetry. I believe that there is a need to recover our cosmopolitanism. And uh, we need to fight against the single root or the single story narrative. And I believe that the key challenge is that we understand that we are all equally valuable. We need to understand ourselves as equals. When we talk about interculturality, it seems that one culture is above another, prevails over another. No, no, not at all. I don't want to integrate into another culture. That's not what I want. I like to, well, Vida was saying that uh, she has that willingness to find uh, new spaces. And, um, and then, of course, you have returned and uh, of course, when you go to a different universe, you need to rebuild yourself. And I'd like to know, well, uh, more about your return to Barcelona. Well, this is an exercise that all human uh, beings do. We all ask ourselves, who am I? Who do I look for? Uh, what's my origin? Where do I come from? Regardless of your race, your color, who your parents are. People ask you... Uh, where you're from because they believe, well, they assume that you, well, don't come from the same place as he or she comes from. My parents are from Equatorial Guinea, as I mentioned, that uh, they come from a very different social, educational, cultural reality that doesn't acknowledge or recognize some aspects of uh, the history, even the Guinean uh, nature of Spanish identity, because Equatorial Guinea was Spanish, was a Spanish territory, and Spain was Guinea to a certain extent as well. So there's an exercise that one does, and this probably has happened to you as well. You don't wake up in the morning th saying, hey, I'm a post-colonial being. Well, until you declare yourself post-colonial. No, no, I don't look at myself in the mirror and say I'm post-colonial. You aren't born uh, with the guarantees of knowing, um, well, you know, who you are. When I uh, left this country, it was because I didn't, you know, identify completely with the culture, with the identity. Here in Spain, I was working at the University of Barcelona. I was studying the history of Africa, Africa from the standpoint of uh, cooperation development, but I didn't identify with uh, that um, uh, Africa. I, of course, uh, studied uh, many theories of many different authors, like the poet that you mentioned. 
and um, I'm a woman, I'm black, and um, as Paul Gilroy says, we need to talk about human identity full stop. And uh, for that time to come, we need to acknowledge our differences, differences that make us unique, not different, but rather unique. We are all unique and multiple at the same time. We need to be free to be who we wish to be. And of course, others complete us, others complement us. Um, and in a way, I must say that this poetry, this way of understanding the world as a plurilingual uh, universe is very much related with what I try to contribute to the cultural institutions. In this edition of the festival, we're talking about translation and we need to think about the work we do as journalists, uh, curators, cultural mediators. And I'd like to ask you about the work you do, the translation work you do in different forms of art and you in the museum and you from Radio Africa magazine and other research projects you're involved in. Well, let me think. Well, I read different texts uh, from different uh, time periods and um, I often, you know, study uh, black thought and I try to understand the world from that uh, standpoint. The black, uh, you know, movement uh, has always attempted to free itself, has been oppressed uh, since uh, slavery times and there have always been thinkers, authors that have been utopian, that have tried to transgress, to try to understand it mankind to try to understand uh, well the nature of mankind and during the enlightenment the concept of humanity was being created and at the same time however well uh, colonialism was happening so um, the black subjects have always been have always been uh, semi men, uh, men or women uh, oppressed. And uh, we don't see these texts in Spanish nor Portuguese. And to translate has to do with reading first, uh, understanding second, third, finding reference. And for me, reading Stuart Hall is very important. He's like a god for me. Uh, this is an author that is very enriching for me. The internet has helped me discover many interesting authors and then well I cherry picked all, all that information in, in order to try to interpret the reality here in Spain either via you know literal uh, translations of articles via radio I try to offer an interpretation of reality considering all this genealogy of the uh, thought and uh, this is something, uh, this is an exercise that needs to be done, in my opinion, because there are founding mothers and fathers of this um, thought school that still have a great deal to say. And in the um, case of, uh, in your case, uh, in order to translate, well, we need to understand that part of the exercise is a translation exercise. And in the case of art, it all starts with creating a platform, an almost invisible platform where there is no interpretation by the institution of those uh, forms of art. So what you need to generate at the end of the day or create is a space, a space for the creation of those aesthetics. We need to make sure that platforms do exist because Sometimes you want to showcase a black artist, for example. I remember I was working at the Tate Museum and, and to introduce the artists in the collection, it wasn't just a matter of, you know, matching them to their uh, pieces of uh, work. No, I also had to make an effort to try to understand the role of the original aesthetics of uh, those uh, pieces of art, those works of art. We need to analyze those spaces that give rise to uh, those creations. 
We need to understand their function, their role in the history of art, and we also have to transform art in order for people to understand that those art forms are art forms in their own right, as we say. In many cases, and in the case of art and art institutions, translations entail a regeneration of the canon of the history of the art practice. Most of the artists, and you were explaining earlier, and we were talking about the Deep Cut platform, the Gothenburg International Biennial for Contemporary Art. You were mentioning earlier in the introductory remarks. And what we did there was to participate in a project called A Story Within a Story, very much based on Glissant and his concept of opacity. In uh, the context of the uh, a, uh, of his poetry, we all have the chance of being opaque. We all have the chance of being not obscure, but rather free, free from all the terminations, save for those determinations decided by us. So that very simple gesture is very very. Interesting, the idea is to create a platform where your freedom and my freedom come can come together. And this in itself is an exercise of uh, translation. This opacity is very important. And there's a way of uh, interpreting paternalism uh, that has to do with invisibility. And many times... We talk about this otherness, and this otherness is sometimes associated to invisibility. And, um, well, we have, uh, you know, many people that want to be visible. Others don't. Others prefer to be invisible. So we need to be able to interpret a group of people that is very heterogeneous, individuals with very different needs. And, you know, we can't go for a standardized interpretation. And as part of the theory of opacity, I believe that we need to make a greater effort to understand the specificities of each individual. And this in itself is a challenge, but we're talking about utopian terms because you don't talk in utopian terms. It's extremely difficult to change society and the status quo. But in any case, we need to start to understand that there are multiple ways of being in a diversity, even in the field of Af the African universe. It's not the same to be a black African from Mozambique or a black African from Equatorial uh, Guinea. Uh, because, uh, well, excuse me if I say so, but there is uh, a certain uh, classification of uh, black hood, you know. We are 400 uh, people from Mozambique uh, all over Spain, 400 of us. At the time, uh, Frank Fanon brought the experience of living like a black. And the translation is uh, a homemade one on the, the fifth uh, chapter of White uh, Mask uh, and Dark Skin. I think we should write the experiences claiming this plurality. But again, I see that if you acknowledge this plurality, I was uh, considering Claudia Jones or Audrey Lore. I mean, these people that would define their work in uh, popular terms rather than academical ones or scientific ones, S even though and not m masculine. And then I was thinking also of some other uh, women that we're not mentioning, and I was thinking about those realities that you certain uh, mentioned that are related to some realities also that we see, like you've been talking about. Uh, being black in Spain, what does it mean in relation to the old uh, colonies? Uh, 
this sort of uh, creates a certain uh, value or classes you as a certain type of uh, black. I'm not questioning, uh, questioning that. I know there are different ways of being black here. And I was thinking about when Achille Membe made this exercise to retrieve the radicality in the reflection about the black uh, subject and, uh, well, his own way, in a very male way, that's what I mean. There is a part that I also vindicate, and that is the fact that this agency that you give to the individual that was not taken into account when formulating who we are as a common imaginary and this is my reflection if my uh, thesis uh, project uh, for my PhD. How do we talk about our, ourselves, about this we, where there is this collectivity that is marked by these realities and unique experiences of each and every one of us, but that uh, pay service to something that goes beyond oneself? Yes, I do understand you, uh, says uh, Tania because there is the opposite place. We operate in a society that somehow goes against, so we have uh, to act as a block, as a group. But that we also means those others, the others on the other side. So there are not really sides, somehow, like a glissant would say. I wish uh, it was uh, like that. Well, I don't know whether we would uh, be uh, seeing this, but we have to make proposals, so that will be the final exercise, and this is only an intermediate step, uh, so we reach that other place, yeah, that uh, we and their no longer exist. No, 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 me estaba acordando de distintas cosas como... Well, I was uh, thinking of many other things. I was thinking about the contrary uh, exercise we had Gabriela talking about. She had this great grandfather, uh, Charles Wiener, that was a European uh, colonizer that was uh, plundering uh, uh, the Incas uh, pieces of art. Then uh, the Amatai, though, also this uh, writer. This is always Europe telling the story. So what happens when we turn this upside down? And then when we see an African person telling uh, stories about Europe, how do we assume this role as privileged people? I am a privileged person uh, in relation to other black uh, women. Yeah, among many other black uh, women. I could uh, talk about many people in my family, for example. So on the interviews, when I talk about being black, being a woman, this is like a necessity to reduce yourself to something that has no exception. And I always said i rather look into the dictionary of uh, synonyms than uh, uh, the uh, the Spanish uh, Academy uh, dictionary. I think there is something that goes lost in translation. Is these spaces in between that I really like? Uh, yeah, the museum I want is a dissident one, and then I want you to feel safe here. It's not always only a place for rage, also for care. Do you remember saying this? Well, you know, when you do interviews, you say so many things. Well, this is an excuse, really, to um, try to be a bridge in between the institutional, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, cultural institution and the street, the academia and the real world. So what do you do in this in-between space? What can you contribute, like in your museum, in the Magba? I don't know whether you like me mentioning this, but we're now holding here an exhibition curated by Paul B. Preciado. And uh, well, when he was curating an exhibition in Magba, in a sculpture has to be removed because it was considered not to be appropriate because it was an anti-colonial and anti-monarchy uh, criticism. How 
how are you in that space in between dissidents and being in places of power? Well, somebody like me have always been working in institution uh, through exhibitions to now see myself as uh, officially managing the narrative is a challenge. But I'm not going to change my practice at the same time because you have to know how to adapt this practice without them uh, losing their ide idiosyncrasy but also uh, paying respect at the same time uh, to what the museum needs. It is difficult not to self-censure yourself and it is a pain painful sometimes exercise. You even lose your own security or safety, uh, the safety in yourself. What was the, uh, the line that you said? I want a dissident museum. Yes, this idea that a museum has to be a place like uh, here to talk about difficult uh, subjects, to hold uh, complex uh, conversations. The showroom, for example, was uh, a time when we were talking about the prevent uh, legal framework from the British government were they were considering to reduce individual uh, rights uh, to favor the collective uh, rights of the nation uh, and this for the sake of uh, security and also talking about terrorism, jihadist uh, terrorism. And there is this uh, really uh, action of having round the table people talking about these complex subjects and giving them this tool so that people that want to be part of this dialogue Dialogue, they can do so, but they can, you can also feel free to face these. I think this is fundamental. And I think not we at the Magba, I mean, like the Magba of this century, we were not doing this kind of things, we will not be relevant to the society. So this is like I'm going to respect European, and even if it's a different one. And I think that is important. And then we all have different approaches or, uh, you know, attitudes. And uh, you ask us to talk about some subject matters, and maybe we disagree, and that's fine. So I think there you have to be very humble, to approach vulnerability, to really uh, try to embrace uh, mistakes. Uh, like uh, the new exhibition we're going to hold at the Magba with uh, Nuria Anguita, Laura Beltes, and Ivan. And uh, there they talk about their experience at the uh, Moroccan Atlas. And they say how they learn from those women not only this idea of uh, rapture, error, and repetition, an error, a mistake uh, that might lead you to something uh, really wonderful, like this uh, textile piece of work. To me, the danger is, and I'm not talking about your museum under your management, but in general, I don't know to what extent museums are not capitalizing the movement that happen on the streets and translate them into workshop or sort of make them be more vain. I think that's dangerous. I mean, that translation that the museum is doing precisely of what's going on on the streets I think in public programs, uh, they keep capitalize this because especially the academia in this country, it's quite poor in some uh, subjects. There are no, there's no room for thinking. So the academia is not doing very well there. And uh, so I think it is important that the museum is tackling these subjects because uh, some people like me, now feel there like uh, we have a place uh, for thinking. And also this space uh, runs the danger to instrumentalize you and also to instrumentalize uh, the muses in their own uh, profit, saying like, I'm gonna do a checklist of what I've got to do, but I'm not really uh, building or creating uh, thinking. I'm not thinking about society, I am absorbing what society is doing because I have to be up dated. Well, I don't know whether you agree that this is not only that they're not creating thinking, 
they only create thinking. One of the issues when we are capitalizing uh, these uh, things uh, or the work that some social agents do and uh, their the danger is that for a long time, I think, especially during what was called the new institutionalization, what happened was that institutions were speculating and even formulating new futures without questioning the role they had to play within this exercise of the capitalization of the knowledge of others. I was talking to Cruz recently. We're going to have a project about the new pay. So where are the foundations? I'm also talking about Gleason. So we were saying, what is the interest to some people uh, to come to Spain or to Barcelona in the particular case uh, to do this project? If we keep on having this constructivist uh, vision of their th thinking. So I think this was uh, something we had to change completely. One of the exercises we do at our museum is to make this reflection to acknowledge how we are placed in a specific social, political, and economical uh, framework that this determinates how we're going to work with the people that we work with. Without that, it is impossible to develop a project because we're only speculating, only producing knowledge, knowledge that is based in the reality of the others. And then the museum comes and makes legitimate and also makes its own. And here the interesting thing would be to say we're going to agree and co-produce um, this uh, knowledge. Yeah, we're going to give more importance to the original spaces where this thinking was produced and to the agents that really produced this way of thinking. I think that maybe we agree or not, but we know our realities, our knowledge has been really sort of eaten up by the museum. And they don't even write our names on the footnote. Yes, and the translation is not like that because it is a very complex uh, uh, process and you comp make more complex your idea of the world and you see different authors and you interpret them and in the, along that process maybe have to be able to say no, that is very interesting too. You've got to say, no, I cannot do what you want me to do immediately because I need time. Same as in Europe, we needed time. Yes, there is this, uh, this process of uh, de-learning, not only learning. So there is this process of thinking that uh, requires more time, more of a pause. And then there is this urgency of the moment that is requesting you to move on. I think you also talk about a museum of uh, feelings. So when we talk uh, being feminist, that you have to really uh, take care of care, precisely. So. Well, I think you have to pay respect to the people you work with, uh, to be respectful, to pay them uh, uh, well, and if you don't have the money, then to find ways to do a, a cultural production uh, duly and produce other ways of exchange, and not only uh, try to produce uh, as if you were a big uh, company without uh, means, because that is slavery. Often I get many emails that are funny. I am merciless, because sometimes they talk about very nice in these mails, emails project. They don't talk about money. These are projects to question the capitalist uh, system, how to create a better future. And then when they ask them, OK, this is very interesting, so what is your deadline? Um, how much money do you want for them? Well, the delivery would be in September, and uh, 
uh, while we're small uh, editing or publishing house, when we sell a book, then you have uh, some rights uh, to some of these. And I usually say, thank you very much, but I cannot do that. This goes against the kind of a project that you are sort of approaching, because I am a mother of three. I've got to devote time to write 10 uh, pages, so I cannot be part of your project. So that gesture, you know, it's difficult. Well, that's the funny thing. This kind of policies, there is a capitalization of what you can uh, prevent in order to try to do something good for the future. You have to tr try in this place of a care you have to pay rightly people. And also take care of all the materials you use, take care of your people, and make proposals that can be critical, because you might be doing something free because you support some people. But what they, what they cannot is uh, try you do it uh, freely. But if there is no money, we're going to think together. We're going to start a process. So I understand that I am thinking with them. So I make my decision whether this uh, common thinking or this jointly effort does not require uh, me to be paid because it's a collective uh, input. But what it cannot be is a university proposing me somebody that gets a salary, and I guess every month, that they propose you uh, as an individual to do something free. Well, but, uh, you know, often we get these uh, ways. I mean, some cultural uh, policies are managed in such a way, so we have to try to, uh, well, put an end uh, to these uh, precarious uh, policies. Out of the script, I am thinking about this group, this group that is intercultural, and they've been debating about how many often they're invited to be part of the commentary or to give interviews uh, for uh, PhD uh, projects. And uh, really, uh, they have to be there for the documentary for two hours, and then they cannot, like, maybe uh, take care of somebody for a couple of hours, but then you should pay me for that time. So when I propose them to be part of an NGO uh, project, and they say, well, I want some kind of uh, uh, remuneration or a reward, even if it's not money, well, what do I get about this? Well, what you get is visibility to make a better world, well, yes, yeah, same as I was saying uh, previously, visibility. I am uh, providing you visibility because you need that. And I think we have to put an end uh, to this. Yeah, we're not going to get money for this documentary. It is part of the work of the NGO, but she's not getting any money. Yes, understanding these processes requires you to understand what is happening, to be aware of what's happening. Yeah, especially, it requires you to say no. How often have we said no? Because capital uh, makes you feel you are missing a chance that maybe by saying no, you're losing something. You're missing something. Before I work at the Magba, I used to have uh, three jobs because I take care of uh, my mother and I have a young uh, child. So how, I mean, to what extent we have to embrace the fear to overcome a certain situation, to say, I'm a freelance person, that is my target, my goal. But before that, maybe I see more chances, but it might be something, uh, something that is going to be a heavy load because I'm being requested to work for free. So these are spaces of uh, true will. So they should not take advantage of you. I think these are practices that take you nowhere. And I've learned myself.
And we've been uh, talking over lunch about this when you have to brought up your children, bring your children up, and you have to be kind of uh, relaxed. You've got to be focused, and you end up doing this job and that job because you have to feed them. But then you end up neglecting them, and you miss them. They're growing up. You don't have like quality time with your children, so you have to make a decision. So talking about care, I want to take care of my closer circle of uh, people. And in order to do that, I've got to say no, be able to say no. I will also have to take care of everybody around me so that I can uh, share with them. And even if I cannot pay them with money, I would uh, reward them somehow or support them somehow. And I should be reciprocal. Okay, one last minute before we go into the Q&A. Uh, we heard Cristina Morales uh, this week, and she was part uh, with Eleni Villar. The name of the publishing house was, uh, well, she was the publisher of this uh, writer, and she was really uh, then very, very critical with these uh, publishers because it's my goal sort of against your uh, uh, freedom uh, to be creative. So how do you see the fact that you open up spaces to artists but without exercising some kind of uh, uh, censorship or this uh, power? Well, this is interesting from the point of view of the curator and the writer and also from the point of view of the institution. Well, you have to sort of, I think, the contemporary museum is lucky to be able to embrace this idea of a change as a, a per se a rationale of the museum. And I think you have to be able to do so because you are not related to the old tradition of museums, related to the colonies, uh, because, I mean, uh, together uh, with the maps, uh, museums were a tool of uh, colonialism. But you have to do this exercise of reinvention and also providing a platform for the people that you are showing, that you're displaying, to be able to place that uh, art experience, but it can be an uh, object or or a talk, a conversation, so it reaches the viewer. So you are granting them a place. If we do not do this, we are betraying the relationship that we have sort of established with these narrations that come from objects and the capacity of the people to sort of get hooked on that. Well, time is up. About museums, I don't have much to contribute. Do we have any comments or questions in the, among the audience? Si no, mientras se arrancan, así, vale. Así, Iván. Es simplemente para agradecerles esta conversación maravillosa. Well, this is a wonderful conversation, and you feel so much at home in that uh, couch. I think in the future, I guess uh, the uh, the uh, cultural policy is the yes, the feel of being yourself. Yes, I said yes. You have to be cool, and I said yes. I'm gonna say cool like three times. And this is what you said about the academia. You know, there is like a certain uh, formula or, uh, or, uh, or, you know, uh, but since I am a mom, I know discipline is also very important. So sometimes we just uh, repeat how we talk, how we understand culture, how we understand uh, uh, knowledge that prevent us from really seeing the other. If they don't share our language, if they drop names constantly, they're not smart. 
if somebody needs a different platform that might be uh, music or a piece of art to uh, share uh, knowledge that is not going to turn into universal knowledge. And I think culture, especially the internet culture, has done, because I was talking to an expert on NFT and cryptocurrency, this has made possible this decentralization of power because this is what Gleason said also, this notion of uh, a world and chaos, these uh, decentralized uh, power given to the idea of archipelago. So this is what you are mentioning, Ivan, really. I think uh, trying always to be natural, to be real, so there is something really that you can hold in that is good, rather than having, you know, these two like upper leaf uh, uh, conference. Yes, this is the conference that we never did. Yes, I think this been acting naturally. I think you need, you know, to act naturally. And I think uh, we should open ourselves uh, to the Caribbean. It's a new world uh, in the field of the thinking. And there are some grammars that sort of organize every moment. If you don't send a certain text with some uh, uh, words, uh, some precise words, it seems like you're saying nothing. And then sometimes also get some projects, because sometimes I am part of a jury. And if you do the checklist, you take everything. It's got the grammar. They talk about everything that has to be talked about, you know. I'm not going to get into a mess here, okay? But it doesn't say anything at the end of the day. And some other projects, they don't use this grammar, but it's still they really provoke uh, changes and are very important. Yes, so I'd like to suggest to you. Uh, Teresa Malmada, she's a philosopher and teacher here in Bilbao, and she's uh, written a book uh, that is called Let's Talk uh, Clearly or Bluntly. So this is about, we're always using these funny words like intersectionality, multiculturality, and whatever, this, this, and that, all those words. But she goes, like, Let, let's talk uh, bluntly. Let's, let's talk clearly about this. Yeah. And also, you said art has to be accessible. And I think maybe we have to introduce some um, uh, artistic expressions that have only been considered our craftsmanship. Yes, and sometimes we forget that all of us, we have a different taste we all have the right to culture, and these are open public spaces. And sometimes there is something that sort of uh, uh, prevent us from going or being there, and that is that grammar that we are mentioning. I think when you are the manager of something like the MACBA, the Contemporary Museum of Barcelona, I think now you get to know all artists, and just Bell, Lancet, and many others to come. And I was with Pera Portabella the other day, and you sit next to this man that is incredible, that really changes how we all understand uh, cinema in a certain time, moment of in time. So when I was talking to Buñuel, I would tell him, well, we've got to claim our right to change, and I am translating myself from Catalan, the uh, film uh, language. And I would think, oh my God, wow. And this is how he can do something like Viridiana. You have to see them, you have to consider this right to claim a specific given language or process. And that goes with, uh, to us, you know, I mean, same goes for us, because we have to de-learn, to unlearn. And you sometimes uh, realize, that's what I want to do with my museum because there is a certain way of doing things, not only in Spain, but in all museums in the world that I think we have to change. 
but not only from a speculative uh, point of view, but also from a structural point of view. And sometimes I guess this is not going to happen while I am managing the magba, but I would like to at least uh, sort of produce the uh, ground for this to happen even in the future, if not now. As regards uh, MACBA, the Museum of Contemporary Art, as Juni has explained, uh, well, I was really happy when you started working at the MACBA. One of the things that caught my attention is something you said along the lines of the museum having to be a place also for uh, those people that sleep well near the museum. How, how do you make that happen? I really don't know. Uh, this is work in progress for me. Yes, we all have a duty of care. I acknowledge the work done by the security guards. Security guards, at the end of the day, uh, are the ones that impose order uh, at the Plaza dos Santos. Today, I had an amazing encounter with a cab driver called Juanjo, by the way, who drove me from the airport to the city center. And he was telling me that he, together with other uh, cab drivers, had uh, driven to uh, Warsaw to assist some families that belong to a Christian community. And he was telling me his story. And I was thinking, well, there are some people out there that have the power of changing the lives of others, the lives of children, the lives of uh, grandparents, uh, relatives of those that have uh, stayed in Ukraine. And I was thinking, what is it that I can do from the museum to be relevant? This gentleman had, you know, spent 1,000 euros to travel to Warsaw to fetch these families. And we, as cultural agents and players, well, we are also a public space, and we need to uh, also play a role. Perhaps I don't need to do anything directly, but I need to create a power of disruption, to nudge change, to force public administrations to do something, to prompt them to action. Alberto is always the first one in the morning. And, uh, well, his... Uh, Job isn't easy, but sometimes I feel very much overwhelmed uh, by what I see when I walk through the Bon Success or um, in the University of Barcelona, there are two homeless men that live there. This is a reality that exists, and I don't want to feel comfortable with this reality. I don't know what I can do, or whether I should do something myself, but as a museum, as a public service, there's much that we can do as well. And the idea here is to try to prompt a change that has an impact, a change that has an impact on the immediate reality of El Raval, the El Raval neighborhood that has many virtues. Uh, has libraries, uh, well, many interesting things. And uh, here in uh, Bilbao, I've seen uh, that, well, some, some people, some homeless, uh, come to the Alondiga, being it as it is a covered space, to find shelter. We cannot feel at ease. We cannot feel comfortable with this uh, harsh reality. 
we as human beings have to do something about this. Perhaps in some years' time I can tell you here that I did something about it. But the first thing that we need to acknowledge is that we cannot feel comfortable with the situation. Well, we are running out of time. Are there additional comments out there or questions? Earlier, you were mentioning museums and colonialism, and we had Gabriela the other day, and in Radio Africa magazine, you recently published an article regarding what has to be done with anthropology museums and all these works of art that are based on violence. I don't know if you want to share some thoughts, or we should just invite uh, the uh, attendance to read the articles and to buy the magazine. It's a very, very interesting magazine. It's a manifesto. So that museums start to rethink the, well, the possibility of giving back to society those um, objects, works of art that were plundered. We need to try to understand the world from other perspectives. We've listened to two women, one born here, other abroad, that converge in the way they see life, that they see the world in a way that is very different to, you know, the way others see it. Uh, or how somebody who was born in Spain and raised in Spain the movements of the diaspora allow you to do different readings or interpretations of the world and understand um, the evil done by the Western world in many parts of the world. We need to seek remediation. We cannot feel comfortable with this. This malaise needs to uh, prompt a discussion and we need to find new ways of relating to others. As Glissard said, let's look for a new poetry of relations. And please, please purchase uh, the magazine. It's um, uh, very interesting. And he also mentioned Dan Hicks, Ivan de la Nuez, has also contributed to the latest issue of the magazine. And uh, Dan Hicks uh, wrote a fantastic book on brutalist museums. And there was this um, other paper by Glissard. And we have the Terbira Museum in Brussels, also worth mentioning. And you know, and it has many works of art from the uh, Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. It's not just about optics. We need to also prompt an ideological remediation that looks to the present of these uh, relations. We're not only talking about, you know, issues from the past. Ivan, Hassan, and you were mentioning this when presenting the magazine the other day. These realities, these narratives are part of who we are. You are. We all are. And I'd like to finish up by making a call uh, and by referring to the uh, uh, Regularization Now campaign. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, non-legal uh, residents have their documents in place. Thanks very much, everybody, for your attention. We will... Leave it here and then move on to the next talk. Thank you.